I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York. A single mom falls hard for a wealthy new man. Was your mom in love with him? But yeah, she was. He treated her like no one else did. Little does she know, she's planning to marry a monster. He's gonna kill me. A man with a secret obsession. Her Prince Charming is a neat freak who goes ballistic over... A drop of sauce on his tile. That's how OCD he was. One stain, they fought about this for a week. Did spilled marinara lead to murder? Mr. Rockwell is dead. Why? And the one dirty detail Mr. Clean left at the crime scene. It was the furthest thing from his mind that he left. Plus, he was the go-to guy for Botox and laser beauty treatments. But is this cosmetic doc really a con man? I remember looking at all those letters below going, he should have had BS behind all these letters. Today, the undercover sting to stop the so-called Botox bamboozler. We're done with this conversation. We're not done. Right now. Andrea Isom, sir, with Crime Watch yeah. Daily. Jason Matero with Crime Watch Daily. This. I'm Elizabeth. I'm here with Crime Watch. I'm Michelle from Crime Watch Daily. Anna Garcia from Crime Watch. Is Crime Watch oh, Daily. Stay off my property. We'll find you again. We always do. Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. First up today, the story of a Texas woman and her desperate escape from a violent past. For the details, let's head out to our Anna Garcia. Chris, Nicole Ledger lived in fear every minute of every day as long as her ex-fiance was out of jail. And sadly, that fear became a tragic reality. Beauty and the Beast. When Nicole Ledger met the monster, it was a recipe for murder, literally. He's gonna kill me. I fully believe he's gonna kill me. Nicole's story will send chills down your spine. She was stalked, held hostage, and sexually assaulted by the very person who once proclaimed he passionately loved her. Nicole was a gorgeous 34-year-old single mom from the Dallas area. She made friends easily. Just ask her best friends, Mike Autry and Holly Wheeler. What drew me to Nicole was just that she was always so big. She, I, I don't know how else to describe it. She was so big. She was very independent. I love that most about her, I think. I just kind of always looked up to her in that aspect. Over time, you know, she became one of my closest friends, as I was hers. Life dealt Nicole a tough hand. She was only 17 when she got pregnant with her son, Trey. My mom was amazing. You know, she played both the mom and the dad since she was a single parent. A single parent who did what was necessary to survive. Dancing in clubs, working for a stockbroker. Nicole had just been accepted to nursing school. Finally, her future seemed bright until the dark day she met Michael Adams. What was your first impression? Uh, weird. Uh, he dyed his hair jet black, I guess, just because he was going through a midlife crisis. Adams was a repo man and quickly stole her heart. Was your mom in love with him? But yeah, she was. Uh, she always talked about how he treated her like no one else did, how he treated her with, on such a pedestal that she felt, I don't know, like a queen. I mean, she, never, she never denied the fact that he treated her really well. What kind of nice things would he do for her? Uh, just small surprises, uh, like a vase of flowers here and there. Um, you know, small I love you notes, uh, like sticky notes in her jacket, just the little things, really. Adams seemed to be a real catch. Look at the red brick mini mansion he owned in the upscale Dallas suburb of Frisco. But Trey says there was one big problem. He was incredibly OCD. I mean, not. And it, and he, nothing was out of place in his house. Everything was in a, a certain point and it never moved. Uh, he had a pool table upstairs and he literally never played on it since he bought it. Adams was so obsessive, he even lined up the labels on his soda pop. When Nicole and Trey moved in, they quickly learned not to violate the one unbreakable rule. 
no sitting on the couch. He had a couch. It was a crescent moon couch, about three quarters. Uh, he absolutely refused to sit on it and didn't want us sitting on it either, or else we would get it dirty. So where did everyone sit? He had one love seat on the outside of the couch and then uh, just a regular chair on the other side. The house was decorated like what you'd see in a glossy real estate brochure. But the closet could have been the cover story for a gun magazine. Right above his neatly pressed t-shirts sorted by color, handgun cases sorted by caliber. Did things change in their relationship when you two moved in? Definitely. How? I can specifically remember one night uh, we had had spaghetti. Spaghetti, Nicole's favorite food. Trey says that night, Adams dished out grief with the ground beef. I guess either myself or my mom had spilt uh, a droplet of the sauce on his tile. And when I microwaved my bowl, um, the sauce had you know gotten over it. I didn't put a napkin over it. The sauce spilled over the bowl uh, in the yeah, microwave? Like popping, like yeah. when it would overheat. Um, that was about a week-long argument between them because that's how OCD he was. They fought a lot. He would be yelling, swearing, saying, you know, why, why didn't you clean it up? Why didn't you, you know, be more careful, I guess? Um, they, they fought about it for a long time. They fought about the spaghetti sauce. Mm -hmm. One Three stain kids. on the tile, yep. and then a little sauce in the microwave. Mm -hmm. They fought about this for a week. Yep, seven days. But as you're about to learn, spaghetti would be the string that would unravel their relationship in more ways than one. Trey says after less than two months, Nicole had enough and moved out. But then Adams asked her to marry him. She was excited. She was all giddy. Um, he came over in a uh, black t-shirt, black pants, you know, dressed out. Uh, they went out to dinner, and then uh, she went back to his house, and that's where he did the proposal. And so Nicole and Trey moved back to the big house in Frisco until the next fight. And Trey says this one was the mother of all fights. He had very aggressively ripped off the ring from her ring finger. I want to say he fractured it. Uh, she had to go to the doctor's office and get a splint for it. Is she done with him? At this point, yeah, definitely. So you move out for the second time, mm -hmm. and the engagement is off. Yes. Trey says after they moved into an apartment, strange things were happening. It started with a chihuahua we had. Her name was Penelope. And we come home one day, and someone had left the front door open. We didn't call maintenance that day. We always locked the door, and Mike had a key. We suspected that he let her out. Um, two days later, we actually found her. She got ran over. After that, I was in school, and I come home. And uh, my mom came home before me, and she actually texted me when I was in school saying somebody had came in and poured bleach all over our clothes. So what did your mom think? I'm pretty sure she suspected Mike. Then what happened? She recalls looking out past the building, because our par car's parked around the corner. And uh, she sees like a kind of a red glow. And so she goes and looks at it, and sure enough, it's our car that was lit on fire. Did your mom think it was Mike? She did. Trey says his mom had no choice but to ask Adams for help buying a new car. So Mike came to the rescue. Mm -hmm. They co-signed on a car, and it was, it was a nice car. It was brand new at the time. Um, they, she had been driving it for a while, and she kept wanting to get the full lease from him to have him take off his name. Nicole went to Adam's house to have him sign over the car title and get her belongings. He whipped up spaghetti, a sort of peace offering. Nicole couldn't refuse a hot plate of pasta. Maybe she should have. Next, terror in the tomato sauce. Just take a few bites, and the room starts spinning. In her own words, the drugging. And I wake up, and I'm tied. My feet are tied to my ankles behind me. The brutal sexual assault. He walks me into the bedroom and takes off all my clothes and then pulls out a. a. Um... 
we're back now with the story of a Texas mom trying everything she can to escape an abusive relationship. Let's head back to Anna Garcia. Nicole Ledger went to her ex-fiance's house to pick up her stuff. It was lunchtime, so they ate spaghetti. But this was no typical marinara recipe. Cops say Michael Adams put a special ingredient in the sauce, a knockout drug. Take a few bites, you know. I'm to get my stuff and the room starts spinning. That's Nicole's dramatic audio statement to Frisco, Texas police detective Scott Greer. I feel it really hit me, and then it just starts hitting me even faster and faster. What Nicole says happened next will shock you. Walks me into the bedroom and takes off all my clothes and then pulls out a, a, um, a really large and <clears throat> I'm saying no, but I can't do anything. I can't move my arms or my legs. Nicole says Adams began to brutally assault her with a sex toy. We never right. used toys like that at all. And, um, and he bends me over and puts it, puts it in and starts taking a bunch of pictures. And, and I was out. I was passed out. Have you ever taken pictures before or? I was thinking, okay. but never like, not with that. And I mean, we've never, never played with any toys at all. So what's the next thing that you remember? Waking up being tied, my hands behind my back. Hog tied with rope, her mouth gagged with duct tape. I've got a ton of duct tape. It's like all the way from here, all the way up to here. It's just a rack around me. The next thing I remember, I'm banging on his neighbor's door. I know, I know he untied me. Nicole managed to get away from her captor. She told police that she ran out of the house naked and screaming for help, but he caught her and dragged her back for yet more torture. Nicole said Adams dragged her into the garage, but being the obsessive neat freak he was, Adams first threw her on top of a tarp, cuffed her hands, and zip tied her ankles. Then he cut off her hair. And he cut off all my hair too. My hair's a mess now. He tried to pull it out and then he just cut it out. How would Nicole escape from the demon she once thought was her angel? She tried wiggling out of the restraints. It took me a while to, I, I untied myself. I just kept playing with it and finally it came undone. But she couldn't slip out of the handcuffs. Nicole realized the only way out, the only way to save her life, was talking nice. What were you saying nice to him? Like, what are you, what are you planning on doing? I'm like, are you, are you gonna kill me? He's like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing yet. I'm like, you just need to calm down. You just overreacted. You know, we need to go to therapy. We can work through it all. Nicole promised Adams she wouldn't press charges if he let her go, but there was no way she could keep that promise. Did you want to file charges on him? Absolutely. I want to bury him. Okay. It, absolutely, I want to. He's going to kill me. I fully believe he's going to kill me. He cannot control his anger. How long is it going to take for you guys to go get him? Uh, still got to dig through a few things. Are you serious? But, uh, well, we'll solve. can't go pick some. him up right some. now? I'm working on it. Uh, um, he's going to end up killing me. Cops quickly got a search warrant, and in Adam's spotless white Lexus, they found the evidence. The sex toy, the rope and zip ties, and duct tape with her hair all over it, and the spaghetti and the jar of sauce. The poison spaghetti was still in the back of the car? He had taken all the stuff from what he had done the day previous, and he was going to get rid of it. But he got arrested before he could do that. Adams was busted, pleading not guilty to charges of sexual assault and aggravated kidnapping. I'm going to give this to you, and if you will just swab it on the both sides of your cheek, we'll put it in the box and then seal it up, and that'll be it. This police video shows detectives taking a DNA swab from Adams. Despite the severity of the charges that could mean life in prison, Adams made bail. Nicole was petrified he would track her down and kill her. So they moved to another town in another county. It would be the last move they would ever make. Next, an obsession turns into terror. It sounds diabolical. 
I would agree. And the police detective who took protect and serve to a whole new level. Now back to the tragic story of Nicole Ledger. Here's Anna Garcia. Chris, what happened inside this house was horrific. Police say Nicole Ledger was fed poison food. She was bound, gagged, her hair was cut off, and then sexually assaulted by a man she once called her fiance. I can't I move my arms to, because he starts taking my clothes off. Nicole Ledger was naked and scared to death. He's going to kill me. Nicole was terrorized by her ex-fiance, Michael Adams, a monster who put a knockout drug in her spaghetti sauce. He told me later that he put something in the food. But um, he said it was regular over-the-counter sleeping pills, but there's no way that that could have done that. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I was out. I was, I was out for a long time. Prosecutors say the attack was revenge for Nicole breaking up with Adams. It makes you wonder if, well, he was going to kill her then, but decided not to. Is that what you think? Oh, absolutely. That night, Nicole's son, Trey, says he got a text, presumably from his mom. It said she wasn't coming home, and she was spending the night at a friend's house. So did she actually write that text, or did he? He did. Mike did. So Mike pretends to be your mom and sends you a text telling you, oh, mom's not coming home. Don't worry, I'm at a friend's house. Yeah. Nicole wasn't at a friend's house. She was at a house of horrors and barely made it out alive. Sickening is what it is. Nicole's friend Holly Wheeler is emotional as she looks at the pictures of Nicole in the hospital for the first time. She was battered and bruised, her feet and ankles savagely cut from the sharp zip ties digging into her flesh. Just a horror bite. It And somebody went through this and such a it's horrible holly says she gave nicole advice on how to vanish from her violent ex-fiance my last conversation with her was when she was asking for advice on how to kind of get away she called me at my office and started to talk because i had been through kind of similar situation you know um bad relationship, kind of crazy stalker, you know, beating kind of deal. And um, she, I had been through that, so she, I knew how to, I got away and kind of got off the radar for a little bit. And so she called to ask, you know, some advice on how to handle it. Nicole was so afraid for her life that she moved here to Melissa, Texas with her teen son, and she rented a home and set up utilities under a friend's name because she was so afraid her ex would find her. But Adams found her, an obvious violation of the court's protective order. So now he's like the crazy man you cannot get away from. Right. So you guys thought you were free. Mm-hmm. But that wasn't true. No. Prosecutors say Adams, now charged with sexual assault and kidnapping, left a godfather-like message on the doorstep of her new house. A tarp and handcuffs, the same ones he used when he kidnapped her. Was that a signal? Well, the theory was that the defendant had put those things there as a threat to Nicole regarding what had happened in the past, and he did not want her to testify. So it was a threat. It also said to them, I found you. Exactly. So how did Adams find Nicole? Remember, he was a repo man, an expert in finding cars. Cops say he secretly put a GPS device on Nicole's car and used his work computer to track her every move. Was he obsessed with Nicole? I would say that he was. He had, for example, a photograph of her um, framed on his bedstand of her topless. That's just so strange and so obsessive in my view um, and offensive. But then Nicole had become the love interest of another man, a man who swore to protect and serve. The detective you heard interviewing Nicole hours after the brutal sex assault, Scott Greer. 
Nicole sent Greer pictures more sizzling than a Texas parking lot in August. Sexy selfies, topless, in the bathtub. They began exchanging emails. What are you wearing? I'll rent us a room and we won't leave it. Most are so sexually charged, we can't repeat them on national television. Nicole wasn't the only crime victim Greer was involved with. After an investigation showing he had inappropriate relationships with four women, Greer resigned from the force. We contacted him for a comment, but he never returned our calls. It makes me wonder if, if he had been focused on actually helping her and focused on keeping her safe and not focused on getting pictures of whatever, then maybe, maybe we'd be in a different place. You know? But it was becoming more clear maybe no one could protect Nicole at this point. And she was clearly aware it could be only a matter of time until the animal attacked again. She texted her son, and this time, it really was her texting him. Stay inside, she said. If Mike comes over, call 911. But the call Trey ended up making to 911 was one he never thought he'd have to make. Next. He cornered Nicole back in the bedroom of her home. Nicole comes face to face again with her crazy ex. But this time, will she escape? No son should have to see that. How in the world can a man who poisoned, kidnapped, and sexually assaulted a woman be let out of jail before he stands trial? It's the mind-numbing question that Nicole Ledger was asking after her ex-fiance, who she says brutally attacked her, was let loose after posting bail. Here's Anna Garcia. Nicole Ledger feared a man who lived 22 miles away. He's gonna kill me. I fully believe he's gonna kill me. A man on the loose with a criminal mind, a dark heart, and a violent temper. Well, we'll you go pick him up. Michael Adams, her ex-fiance. Nicole and her son Trey worried Adams would track her down and kill her. She looked at me and she said, you know, Trey, he's gonna find us and he's gonna kill me. Their worst fears were about to come true. I had gone to school that morning. Before I left, you know, I gave her the good old, you know, love you see when I get back, kiss on the forehead. That would be the final kiss. When Trey came back home, the smell of death was in the air. Everything seemed out of place. Something didn't seem right. I go over to her bedroom door and I knock on it, you know, wake up, I'm home, and you know, I didn't hear anything. So uh, I peek under the door to see if I can see her, and I see her foot hanging off, and I think she's just asleep still, so I knock a little bit louder, you know, wake up, I'm here, and the door was locked, so I couldn't open it. So I go into the kitchen, I grab a ballpoint pen and take it apart, and I use the ink cartridge to kind of pick the lock. So at this point, I'm decently scared, and I finally shoulder it open, and she's laying on the bed. She had her underwear down on one ankle. She had her shirt lifted up over her chest. She had been shot in the head. No son should have to see that. No. Yeah. So I run out to the front, Close the door, close the front door behind me and call 911. What's the address of your emergency? <laughs> My mom's dead. There's blood everywhere. Nicole was shot twice in the face. She died instantly. Why? Why did he have to take her away? <laughs> Nicole's friend Holly Wheeler was at work when she got the phone call that Nicole had been shot to death. I started crying, bawling, and we were all kind of pretty close at the office. We were, you know, so it kind of, kind of hit us all pretty hard. But was it Adams or someone else? You knew who did it. Mm -hmm. It was Mike. But Adams claimed he had an alibi. 
These images from a surveillance camera show him shopping at Home Depot around the time of the murder. And at the crime scene, cops found two used condoms from two different men. So who killed Nicole? It took nearly six months for cops to finally find their killer, Mike Adams. And another three for an indictment on a capital murder charge. What took so long? It takes a while for all that evidence to be collected and tested, and ultimately uh, his DNA was found on an item at the scene. That item, one of those used condoms. But Adam's DNA wasn't on the inside. It was on the outside. How did he leave the DNA? Well, his DNA was found at the crime scene, and it was epithelial or skin cell DNA. It was on a condom that was close to the top of the garbage in the master bath. It could be that he was washing her blood off of his hands, and he picked up that item and put it in the trash, not thinking that he would actually leave behind DNA that could be you know, linked to him later. Investigators believe Adams was so obsessed with cleanliness, he picked up the condoms and threw them in the bathroom trash, a move that got him arrested. It was the furthest thing from his mind that he left DNA at the crime scene. There was other damning evidence presented in the murder trial. At Adams' storage locker, cops found a virtual arsenal. Ballistics tests showed one of those guns fired the bullets that killed Nicole. Describe to me what it was like seeing him in court. <sighs> Nerve-wracking. How did you feel? Terrified. I made eye contact with him briefly and never again. Prosecutors said the motive was to prevent Nicole from testifying against him in the rape and kidnapping case. The first witness up was Detective Scott Greer, the man who sexted with Nicole while he was investigating her case. Adams' defense attorneys tried to poke holes in his testimony. Were you afraid at that moment when his credibility was called into question that your case was in trouble? No. There was so much other good corroborating evidence. Evidence from the star witness, Nicole herself, a voice from the grave. He's going to kill me. I fully believe he's going to kill me. That was enough to convince the jury. After less than two hours, they returned with a verdict. Guilty of capital murder. The sentence, automatic life without the possibility of parole. Why do you think Mike killed your mother? He was rich and he was successful. And she was the first person that ever said no. What do you want to see happen to Mike? Um, I've seen cases where prisoners were murdered, someone over that, you know, killed them in their cell. I don't want that to happen to him. I want him to sit in prison for the rest of his life. And now, this young man has to face the rest of his life without the mom who sacrificed everything, even her own life, for him. Is there anything you do to honor your mom? Spaghetti. <laughs> uh, every year on her birthday, I always have just regular spaghetti with meat sauce and ground beef, just to kind of commemorate her. When are the times that you miss her the most? When I need advice. You mean like when you need your mom? Yeah. Adams is asking for a new trial, saying all of the evidence gathered from his trunk, including the drug spaghetti sauce, was obtained illegally. So far, that request has not been granted, and when you look at the evidence, it's kind of hard to believe it ever would or should be. Coming up, he was the go-to doc for Botox injections until his patients started getting suspicious. It certainly wasn't Botox or it wasn't dice board or certainly, I don't know what the hell it was. The undercover investigation targeting an alleged cosmetic con man. Is he really a doctor? What we uncovered about his past with a long rap sheet. What do you think needs to happen? He should be in prison. That's next. More than six million Botox injections were performed last year, making it the most common cosmetic procedure in the country. But what if you found out the doctor who put that needle in you wasn't a doctor at all? Instead, he was a convicted felon. We're teaming up with our affiliate in Phoenix, ABC 15, for a shocking undercover investigation about a guy known as Dr. Craig. Here's reporter Dave Biscovic. 
The guy in the white lab coat calls himself Dr. Craig, and he runs a cosmetic clinic in Tempe, Arizona, selling youth and making injections. The only problem is he's no doctor. He stuck needles in you? Mm -hmm. He focused in on this side here, and that's when my face was just... Craig Sherp is actually a convicted felon, and he doesn't have a state license to perform the medical and cosmetic services he advertises. I remember looking at all those letters below going, wow, he should have had BS behind all these letters. In an exclusive ABC 15 investigation, I went after the alleged Botox bamboozler at his offices. We're done with this conversation. We're not done. Confronting him about his alleged shady business practices. We run a legitimate place here, that's it. The door of the med spot says, my laser center. But the reported doctor imposter has a long list of other names for his business. I've been doing reconstructive surgery for a while now. Well, that is until two producers with hidden cameras and microphones investigated the alleged cosmetic con man. All right, you cameraing me? Huh? Is this a button? The medical clinic bills itself as a one-stop shopping hub, offering a variety of cosmetic procedures like Botox, tattoo removal, and human growth hormone. At first, it all looks legit. Let me clean the room and we'll get you in there. Okay. The producer says she's interested in getting Botox, and Sherv seems ready to inject her on the spot. I'm going to have you leave your purse and everything right here, well, and we're going to go in there. Hold on, I have a lot of questions. Yeah, no problem. After hearing his pitch, Courtney tells the man who calls himself Dr. Craig she wants to think about it. But the smooth wannabe doc won't take no for an answer. I have a couple girls that are coming back for like the third or fourth time. If you want to sit in and watch them, they have no problem with people watching because I've done it before. It's unusual offers like this that caused people to turn to ABC 15 for help. This person who asked us to obscure their identity met Surf professionally and said he seemed suspicious. He could be giving people diseases. What if he's reusing needles? This guy could be really dangerous. Dangerous, and it appears the guy is raking it in. Check out his deals on Groupon. He sold hundreds of coupons recently for expensive injectables like Botox and Dysport. He makes up a lot of things. Dr. Craig is no stranger to the law and to playing doctor. Police detective Lily Durand was part of a 2011 sting operation leading to Scherf's arrest after he set up a medical marijuana dispensary. He wore a lab coat. He wanted people to believe that he was a doctor. Scherf was charged with possession and sale of marijuana. He pleaded guilty to a pair of felony charges, but was only sentenced to serve two years of probation and pay thousands of dollars in restitution. But you gotta hand it to the guy. He's ambitious. In addition to running the med spa, he appears to run two coffee shops and a meat market. But perhaps the biggest shocker is that in the early 90s, he worked as a cop and was canned after just two years. You know, our investigation uh, showed that he was uh, lying about a lot of things. Now more alleged victims of Sherp's reported cosmetic scam are coming forward with their horror stories. Is this the guy? Oh yeah, absolutely. Client Mario Delacasa went in for injections, but he came out bruised, the side of his face swollen. It certainly wasn't Botox or it wasn't Dice Board or certainly, I don't know what the hell it was. Mario sent pictures of his face to Scherf and this is the email he got back. I've never seen anything like that. He says that when you go home, put a vacuum cleaner thing on your face as well, actual vacuum cleaner, and suck on your, and your skin, pull on your skin because that's gonna create he circulation. to put a vacuum, vacuum cleaner on my face. Sharon Kirby went to Dr. Craig for what she thought would be rejuvenating jabs. I think it was here, 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 and then by my eyes, so eight places. Yeah. Looking back, she remembers the reported fake physician boasted about his credentials saying that he was a doctor in Afghanistan, a Navy SEAL, and studied Eastern medicine. There was bruises, there was bleeding. To me, that's, he assaulted me. What do you think needs to happen? Oh, he should be in prison. After our undercover visit, I called the office only to be told Dr. Craig is out of town. You're not telling me the truth. Uh, we know he's in today, so we're gonna come to see him in about 15 minutes. We're gonna be walking in his door in about 15 minutes. Can you let him know? We see him slinking out the building. We try to catch him, but he gives us the slip. Can you go the elevator? It's going up. Sprinting up the stairs, we turn a corner. There he is. Dr. Craig, I'm Dave Bisping with ABC 17. That's a whole other one phone. It's not Dr. Craig, it's Craig. Okay. I heard you write Dr. Craig on people's business cards. What's it? 
You've written Dr. Craig on people's business cards. Yeah, that's what people call me because I'm a laser tech, and that's what I do. So. You're doing Botox? No, I'm not. We have okay. undercover video of you doing well, Botox. That's good. that's good. Where are you getting it from? I'm not getting it from anywhere. Well, you're giving it to people. When we confront him on his non-existent medical license, more lies pour out of his mouth. I do laser procedures. Are you licensed to do laser procedures? Yeah. Not in Arizona or not? Yeah, I am. We've been licensed, they laser, they license the machines, and our machines are licensed. You need to be licensed to do it. We are. Just come show me your license. We don't care. The license are on state with the state. They're not. I checked your name. Here's proof from the state board. He's not. Have a nice day. No, 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 Doc. We gotta talk to you about this. I'm not treating people. I'm not stuff you're not allowed to be doing. No, that's not, dangerous. I, I have natural paths that do it, and I have other doctors that come in. We run a legitimate place here. That's it. Plain and simple. This is legitimate. We have, is your medical marijuana club? We don't have a marijuana club. You ran when you got busted for doing it. You're wrong there. Unfortunately for the fake Doc, this is the detective who busted him. He got arrested, right? Yes, he did get arrested. Look at this. Look at this. This is you. It's, Craig Surf, yeah. you pled nice guilty. Day. Have a nice You pled guilty. Have a nice day. Come on. Since our investigation started, a lot has changed. 17 alleged victims have come forward, and the state attorney general's office is now investigating. So far, no charges have been filed against Scherf yet. But as for his clinic, it's been shut down. A sign on the door says, in part, the staff of my MD clinic has decided to close our doors for good. Let's hope that's the case. And if not, well, Dr. Craig can expect to see us again. And coming up next, Dr. Oz weighs in on the so-called Dr. Craig investigation. He's got a warning for anyone thinking about getting Botox. If I inject Botox in the wrong place, I can blind you, I can paralyze you, I can leave you disfigured for life. That's next. This is undercover video of a man known as Dr. Craig, allegedly offering treatments like Botox at an Arizona medical clinic. Problem is, he isn't licensed and he isn't a doctor, rather a convicted felon. Now to talk more about the Dr. Craig story is a real doctor, Dr. Mehmet Oz. Thank you so much for letting us crash your office. What do people need to know when they go out to get Botox? People like to find deals, but that's dangerous sometimes. Well, first of all, it's a third the price of anything you've ever seen in your life. Be aware of the fact that you get what you pay for. You know, a little bit of price discrepancy is okay, but the bigger issue is there are ways for people to check whether a doctor is legitimately a doctor. State medical boards exist. You can literally go online, see, does this person really have a board certification? Are they convicted felon? Do they lose their license? A lot of times people are doing procedures like Botox because they're so easy to do. They can go to that technique from any background. If I'm a psychiatrist, what do I know about Botox? So double check to make sure that things fit. What's the danger here if you get the improper dosage? When I put a needle under your skin, I can do devastating damage. If I inject Botox in the wrong place, I can blind you, I can paralyze you, I can leave you disfigured for life, I can infect you and scar you in ways that are unimaginable. Why would I pay for that right? Dr. Craig is a convicted felon operating in an unregulated medical spa. Huge danger. It's a big blemish, I think, on the entire profession of medicine that these medical spas are, are unregulated. Some of them are fine, with real doctors doing great work. Many of them are filled with people who can't get jobs elsewhere. And so they sort of back their way into a position, oftentimes unregulated, yes, but also unlicensed. So it's not like they bent the rule a little bit. They literally have no right to do these things. And remember, if I take a needle and put it beneath your skin without a license, that's called assault and battery. I'm not allowed to do that. There's a special covenant that physicians have with society that allow us to do these things because ideally we're trained and qualified to do it. We see Botox parties on shows like The Real Housewives. Mm -hmm. You think sometimes we're too casual about these treatments? Chris, is a beautiful question because it hits everything perfectly out in the, in the broad daylight. We are trivializing the use of very dangerous medications. Medications which when used correctly can be used safely in large numbers of people. But that's why you need a medical license to prescribe and apply these products. They're not designed to be used by hacks who happen to find an easy way of making a little extra money. How pervasive is this problem? It's much more pervasive than we think because it's completely unregulated. We're now seeing the, these events take place in gas stations. And we're massive gas stations. Gas stations uh, there's, uh, malls, parking lots, where women, because they want to look different than they look right now, are willing to let people do things to them. Probably somewhere in the back of their mind is the realization that there's a danger there. Please, let's use your show as, a, as an opportunity to broadcast it widely. Be aware, warn people, and guess what? You catch someone doing this kind of stuff, call somebody. And get some allies in there, like law enforcement, because they'll shut these guys down like that. How quickly are these spas or clinics popping up? You ever play the game whack-a-mole? It's like <laughs> whack-a-mole. 
The problem with these spas is it's so easy to open one that as fast as law enforcement and great shows like yours can identify these uh, terrible folks and knock them down, they come back up again. When you go into a medical clinic, ask a couple basic questions. Make sure they've got a medical license, have them show it to you, and double check that it's true afterwards. And always, always try to stall a tiny bit to understand exactly what's going on around you because your instincts are usually on target. Dr. Oz, thank you very much. We'll be right back in a moment, everyone.